Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Thursday, October 13th edition of the Basement Academy. Our morning psalm is really, really one of my favorites. <laughs> I know I say it every day, right? But have loved this one for a long time, partly because it's really short. <laughs> but it extols the virtues of being in unity, in relationship with God's people. And uh, years ago, uh, turned this into a little song, a little worship song that I play with some regularity. And so let's read Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Hmm. That's it. Three verses. <laughs> How good it is to live in unity with brothers and sisters in our families, in our places of work, in our neighborhoods, in our churches, in our wider community. Unity is the exception rather than the rule for the human family, right? And so from Adam and Eve onward, from the fall, let's put it that way, prior to the fall, there was nothing but unity, right? But sin shatters the unity that Adam and Eve had with each other and with God. Obviously, Cain and Abel didn't figure it out. And, and so really, the, the story of the Bible is a story of disunity, of disharmony where relationships struggle, uh, marriage relationships, parent-child relationships, sibling relationships, neighbors fighting neighbors, nation fighting nation. And so when God's people come to a place of unity, and of course unity we believe is found only in Jesus Christ and only in Christ, not a unity uh, based on our race, our class, our gender. And this is the, the genius of the Apostle Paul, right? In Christ, there is no Jew or Greek. There is no male nor female, slave nor free. The, the ways that we categorize and define and, and uh, um, uh, divide each other is overcome, is transcended, in Christ. There is a unity in Christ. And so this discipleship amid disagreement, this theme really is about how can we move towards a greater unity? This is what a flowering discipleship will, uh, will look like, a flourishing discipleship. Anyway, love Psalm 133. Um, read it often, sing it often, pray it often. Uh, may it be so in your life and mine that we would live and find the, the joy of unity. Um, okay, we're turning the corner on the home stretch uh, reflection today and tomorrow about some opportunities and challenges and dangers maybe that we need to beware around some of these realignment issues. Um, and then next week, just kind of want to bring the, the plane in for landing thinking about how denominational realignment can also provide us a, a workshop, as it were, for a wider witness towards unity and, uh, and faithful discipleship and in other areas of disagreement. So going back to, I think this was week one, maybe end of the week, might have been the beginning of week two, the workshop of disagreement, if you recall that. So discipleship as apprenticeship, with that kind of governing image, the apprentices go to the workshop to learn the craft, the skill, the art. And what I've offered that this kind of entire reflection is 
in, in the, the notion that the workshop of disagreement is a place of growth, that God intends for us to grow through this. East of Eden, we experience disunity more than unity. Unity is the exception. Disunity is the rule. So disagreement is the rule. And so it's the primary workshop God uses to develop faith and hope and love, to shape our character, to uh, teach us self-examination, to have us reflect on our own words and attitudes and actions, that, that something happens in the workshop of disagreement. So if we want to grow, opportunities abound when it comes to this issue of denominational realignment. Hopefully this study has been helpful. Uh, we've kind of, like we've been driving on safari and we've slowed the car down a little bit. <laughs> we know there's a little bit of danger, you know, like, oh my gosh, there's wild animals. But when we slow the thing down, we see the vistas, we see the animals, we see, you know, what's happening rather than just, you know, just flying on by, getting through this thing as quick as possible. Let's go ahead and be patient. And so hopefully you have seen uh, that there's benefit um, to this process, thinking it through. And so if we want to grow, there's opportunity after opportunity built into this um, realignment discussion. And if you don't want to grow, what does that say, huh? <laughs> What does that say about you? I, I, I don't want to grow. I just want to get out. I don't want to grow. I just want to be done with it. And, and so some of us maybe are conflict avoiders and some of us have a, a distaste for disagreement. We have to learn to love the workshop, not the disagreement as much, but the workshop of disagreement. Something happens there. And so... Most of us didn't receive training early on, right? Most of us didn't learn in our families, um, in school or other places, how to work through our differences. We just didn't learn this thing. You know, the way we learned is to punch it out on the playground, slam doors, cold shoulders, ignore, pretend, you know, avoid all that stuff. That's, those are the strategies we learned. And of course, there's no freedom there. There's no growth there. It just keeps us, you know, kind of bound up. Anyway, um, I've just written down, you know, I've, I've got these study guides that I, I put together back uh, in the summer when I was on my study leave. And so I've just written a bunch of statements and there's 30 more. There's probably 15 here that I'll read. And there's probably 30 more that we could develop. But you know, put on the whiteboard here, some opportunities that realignment may afford us. Again, not everybody, not, not every one of these may, may bubble up and not every one of these um, we may enjoy, right? <laughs> um, but I think there are opportunities to mature and deepen our faith, hope, and love. Um, what, this, this thing about self-examination, right? Um, Practicing the tools of our apprenticeship, we will grow in self-examination and repentance. So if we, if we practice the tools, if we're, if we're in the workshop, we can't but examine ourselves. These are the tools I've just gone through, right? The Genesis quadrant, um, the flip the script, uh, and, and so on. These are tools to have us look inwardly rather than outwardly. What, what's that saying about me if I can't think of something good to say about this person or that person. What's that say about me if I can't find anything to criticize, if I can't flip the script and, and you know, critically uh, examine my own camp or my own position or my own party or my own, you know, people, tribe. So uh, we, we will grow in self-examination and then repentance is the process of rethinking. Okay, I need to rethink this thing. It's not always an emotional word, though there are often emotions with it. Repentance isn't so much feeling sorry. It's, I got to rethink this thing and I'm sorry that I have not seen this clearer before this. 
I'm sorry that I may have wounded people by my attitudes or actions. I'm sorry that I have, you know, dishonored the glorious name of Jesus by my, you know, pugnacious ways, <laughs> you know, in, in, in places of disagreement. So um, we will learn to pray for those with whom we disagree, who may oppose us, uh, who may, um, you know, may not speak well of us. Um, we will learn to bless those who might curse us. Again, nobody's going to curse us, but in disagreement in general, we often find those temptations. But we will learn to pray for others that we, that, that we might consider our enemies, and this is a good thing. Um, the nature of this process, the nature of disagreement and working it through, the nature of the realignment process. Again, if we get into that, it's not a hundred percent, you know, we haven't formally begun any realignment process with the denomination, though there's been some early conversations. Uh, the nature of the process will develop uh, perseverance and patience. There will be an element of fortitude that, um, we'll have to develop. We, we saw this with our building project. We just wanted it quicker than we could get it. Things were happening, you know, we were digging in the dirt and they were laying pipes and blah, blah, blah. You can't see a whole lot of activity in the early months of the building project. But then they pour the slab and once the walls start to go up and the roof, get, then it starts to take shape and so, um, so I've learned that there's a patience required for big projects. And a lot of us just don't always have that patience. So the big project teaches us patience. Um, we will grow in our ability to articulate our beliefs and our convictions. Um, I, I pray that it will be with kindness and compassion, that truth will be spoken with grace that we will be gracious in our pursuit uh, of the truth. Um, but, but a lot of us haven't had to think about, well, why, why I, I just feel this way. I believe we'll, we'll articulate that, clarify that. What, what is the biblical basis for that? And so this is a good thing to learn how to articulate our faith. Um, I, I think we will learn some aspect of uh, sacrifice um, where sacrifice, I'm certainly sacrificing time, you know, I'm getting a lot of time to this. The elders and leadership of the church have, have given significant amount of time and conversation and wrestling through some of these issues. There, there may be additional sacrifices that are uh, called, uh, that we are called to make. There, there may be sacrifices in addition of time, but also of, of money don't know that because the process hasn't been endured yet. Um, but the, the sacrifices that we will uh, experience will teach us something of Jesus who sacrificed himself, who laid down his life. So there will be a laying down of life. Uh, we may not always be spoken well of and so we will wrestle with not speaking ill of others who may not speak well of us if indeed we go through this process. Um, if there are sacrifices of money involved, that will be a good thing because m most of us, really probably all of us, love money. And the love of money is the root of many kinds of evil. Uh, Paul uh, instructs Timothy and us. <laughs> and so we love our money. Um, you know, we, we talk about faithful stewardship, but, you know, we're not always eager to give 10% or more of our income or our assets and resources. You know, if we did, we'd never have a budget problem in the life of the church, right? And so um, I think... You know, if there's some sacrifice, monetary sacrifice involved, that will not be a bad thing at all. Um, I know everybody may not agree with me on that. Um, we will learn this thing of submission. 
the the membership of Greenwich is called to submit to the leadership of Greenwich. You know, the pastors and the elders. We're patiently walking through this. It's a it's a it's a thoughtful and delicate process. We want to be wise and patient and and humble uh, and, and courageous as we go through this. And so I know waiting is frustrating. And so I've heard from a number of folks over the last number of months. Um, since we held our leadership conversations uh, back in the spring, God, that was just you know February and March. You could almost say the winter, um, and you know we were reflecting on general assembly prior to and then after, and the, there are some people they're like, let's go, let's go, 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 run, 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 and I said, you know, we're things are happening. There, there's a patience required, so there's a submission required. If we are to go through this realignment process, it, it will require us to submit to uh, the process as outlined, the policy as developed by our presbytery. I was involved with developing that, that, that policy. Submission is something we don't like to do, but it's something we need to do. We are called to do. Scripture calls us to do that. Submit to governing authorities, so we submit to one another. Parishioners are called to submit to their pastors and to their leaders because we have to give an account. But submission in a highly individualistic society such as we live in, submission is a dirty word. I'm not submitting to anybody. Well, as Christians, you know, we will bend the knee and confess with the tongue that Jesus is Lord. We are not Lord. Jesus is Lord. So, so we will have an opportunity to practice the discipline of submission, which will be a good thing. Um, if accusations of wrongdoing come, that is, if others look at us and speak of us in ways that, you know, we're heretics or schismatics or we're bigoted or we're narrow-minded— because of some of the views that we may hold, you know, we wish that not to happen. We wish to cause no offense. This is the motive for realignment. We wish not to offend. You know, our, our, our minds and hearts are, are shaped by these scriptures, which teach us, uh, many of us teaches us that marriage is only a man and woman. We wish no offense, but we may call, but offense may be caused. And, and people may speak ill of us, and so we will have to endure that reality. Again, a lot of folks probably at Greenwich won't hear it. I might hear some of that a little bit more. Um, I think we will, I've, I've got written here, we will benefit greatly by learning to get the log out of our own eye. So I guess we've already talked about that self-examination. Uh, we may learn things about ourselves that help us in other relationships where we have disagreement and conflict. And this is really where I want to go next week to see the realignment process and everything that happens there is really a work, a particular workshop that may have a much wider application. And so that's how I want to end the, the series of reflections. Um, you know, going back to that uh, reading from my uh, former pastor, Charlie Drew, about having an opportunity, how we conduct ourselves with one another in times of disagreement. Charlie was writing in the context of political disagreement, but how we conduct ourselves with one another will provide a, an opportunity for us to be a living alternative to contempt. The world has contempt. It, the world teaches us to, to hold others in contempt. If you don't agree with me or you disagree with me or, or don't allow me to, to tell you my convictions and you disagree with me, I'm just going to, you know, a pox on your house. We hold each other in contempt and with disdain. But we Christians are going to live differently. We're going to live differently with one another. And so we want the world to see a living alternative to contempt. We want to be sociologically inexplicable. People can't explain how, how, how is Greenwich Church going through that process and they're not fighting with each other and they're not fighting with the presbytery and the presbytery is not fighting with them. How in the world is that happening? Well, it's because we commonly have a Lord Jesus who's guiding us in a path of unity even through our disagreements. 
So we're going to have that opportunity as well. And I think there will come a time when our worship services and gatherings may take on a deeper meaning as if we get into this process and we keep everybody, you know, abreast of it all, of course, you know, there will be prayer gatherings and other worship uh, times that, that may take on greater significance because of the moment that we're walking through. The same way with our building project, there was groundbreaking and then there was, you know, moments along the way of update and celebration and then there was the, the joy of completion, right? So that, that's what I mean. But ultimately, I think the opportunity is for us to experience God. That, that's, that's what this is all about the opportunity for us to experience God at work in our lives, humbling us, shaping us, leading us, guiding us, disciplining us, protecting us, uh, providing for us. Um, We may yet see his hand at work in some beautiful expression of reconciliation and unity, some unexpected blessing from those that we might expect to be opponents or perceive to be his enemies, we might find they are not this at all. They are siblings. They are brothers and sisters in Christ. They wish us well, even as we wish them well. Uh, there may be creative solutions that, that, that emerge that we can't even imagine right now because God does far more than we could ever ask or think. This is the God we worship. And so, uh, Let's never dream or think or imagine that we've got it all figured out, that we just need to, you know, just march on through this realignment thing and be done with those people and let's get off into the promised land. It is not that at all. Uh, These friends at Presbytery are our sisters and brothers in Christ. Uh, Though you don't know them, I do. These are good people. I want to share more about this next week. These are good people who love Jesus, who love the word, who love the church, and by extension, love you because they know Don and Eric and Lee Bishop and Mark Hermes, a few folks they do know at Greenwich. They've had a positive experience, so there's no reason for them to think ill of you Uh, as you sit there at Greenwich Presbyterian Church worshiping. So anyway, these and more are opportunities that await us that maybe we've already begun to experience a little bit because this realignment has given occasion for this study to even take place. And so some of the thoughts that I've raised in the last several weeks may not have been raised absent this, this, um, this consideration of realignment. So anyway, gone on long enough. Let, let's close here. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about some challenges and dangers to be aware of as we walk through this process. So anyway, hope you can join us tomorrow. Let's pray. And so we simply say, thank you, O oh God, for your mercies, which are new every morning. And so through this day, may we find ourselves uh, with glad and grateful hearts. And may we live uh, in unity with all people as best we can. And may we do our best to love you, heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourself. We offer this prayer in the name of the one who loved us first, even Jesus our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God be gracious to you and bless you. May he keep you and may his favor rest upon you this day and forevermore. Amen.